Today, our guest is a strength and conditioning coach. He is a strength and conditioning coach for athletes, and he's also a public speaker for health and wellness and is a founder of a sports and fitness instruction. Please welcome Coach Paulo Aguirre. Hi, Coach Paulo. Hello, How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Earl. Thank you very much. Hi, guys, our listeners here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for accepting this invite. So first things first, being a person in the wellness industry, is this one of your dreams that you realized when you were still young? Yeah, I think this started back in high school since I've been very well involved with sports. Okay, athlete like I started becoming an athlete at the age of five, six years old. So the idea of wanting to be part of a sports industry has been there since the beginning. High school, actually. I've been writing about, I want to be part of this one. I want to be part of that one. You must have been a very sporty person when you were still a kid. Yeah. There's no summer that I'm not part of a certain sport. From six onwards, up until I graduated high school, I've always been part of a certain sport. Like my first sport was swimming, transitioned to long distance running, wow. transitioned to track and field, short distance running. I went to taekwondo also. All sorts of sport, football, basketball actually also was part of it. Ping pong, table tennis. So I've been so much involved. You won't see us inside the house for so long. We're always training every day. We train like two or three sports in a day during the summer. You won't find us inside the house watching TV or doing nothing or actually just helping the chores is already given. But my parents probably wanted us to be so active na we're always doing something outside. Does your family have an athletic background or does it happen that your parents instilled in you to be physically moving? Uh, no, I was born in an athletic family. Ah. My parents were athletes as well. So my dad used to be part of the national team in basketball. My mom used to play professional ping pong or table tennis. Both of them were really so involved in sports. So when they got together, got married, they made sure that we're always playing, we're always moving, we're always doing this, we're always doing that. But it's not always just sport, ah. Don't get me wrong on that. It's a mix of brain and bronze. We're moving, but also my mom has been involving us in a lot of the arts. So mm. that's writing, painting, music, those kind of things. But you know, it's a great athlete life since wow. then. Well, I think it's a rare case that the spirit of athleticism has passed on from one generation to another. That's really evident in your family. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Very athletic. Yeah. So being an athletic individual, do you have a favorite sport in mind? Favorite sport, I think it's a given thing that everybody wants to play basketball. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural thing, I guess. So that is part of it. But I think in terms of individual sport, I love track and field so much. Mm -hmm. Any event of the track and field, I love watching, I love doing back then. Okay, karon naman ang honga, zero workout. But yeah. back then, it's always running, it's always be part. If the Olympics is around, I don't sleep just watching track events, who won on this event, who won on that event, so on and so forth. So yeah, track and field again. That's interesting. And if I'm not mistaken, your love for the sports has also led you to take a course that you studied in university. Yeah, actually. So I love to be part of a sports stuff and all that. So it was my course in San Carlos. Yes. And then I just transitioned to Manila and then tried to finish a master's degree oh. in sports science. And then I did a lot of continuing education on sports science, strength and conditioning, nutrition and other things in Manila. But I think I've been learning so much outside of school. So it was me in college. I became an apprentice of P.S. Solan at 17. So mm. I became a quote-unquote working student every summer. He was my mentor. I was his apprentice. So I study. I read all his books. Because he graduated sports science naman in UP. Mm. So every book that he had that came from UP, I devoured everything every summer. So it was my course. But I learned a thing or two in college. I'm not going to lie about that. I gave my best there. But the bulk of learning that I got was more 
of when I was with Pio inside mm. the gym reading all his books uh, not in the four walls of the university but you know don't get me wrong I was really good in school also ah okay <laughs> I was really good in school. That's one thing to clarify. So how are you able to become a strength and conditioning coach after so many years of study? The decision you make, actually, there's so much tracks that you can actually go to. It's just so happened that when he became my teacher in two subjects, if I remember it correctly, it was biomechanics and applied kinesiology, something like that. And it took me in as an apprentice after one subject that I excelled into. And then that's the decision I made. I want to be like him. I want mm-hmm. to be a strength coach like him. So I worked for and with him for five years. Mm-hmm. Then I graduated at what, 21, 22, 21 actually. And then mm-hmm. I have to do continuing education after that. I have to study, I have to read, I have to take certifications on strength and conditioning so I get more equipped. And I'm acknowledged by an international body on sports or strength nice. and conditioning sports. Nice. So uh, I was licensed by CSES and then also ASCA, Australia and America. Mm-hmm. I was also licensed by Russia, but that was more on kettlebell work. So I became a strength coach because I also took a lot of this license certification. So I get acknowledged, but I already made the decision when I was still in college, but I want to be like this strength coach, helping athletes, so on and so forth. Yeah, that's nice. And you eventually became a strength and conditioning coach in your own way. So take us to how you are as a strength and conditioning coach and how that journey is like for you. It wasn't easy, actually, you know. I'll start with that statement. Any journey is never easy. It wasn't easy because, one, you actually don't know what you're going to do 10 years from now yet or which team you're going to be serving or you'll be doing more of client work instead of athlete work. Mm-hmm. So on my end, how was I as a strength coach? I really did. The journey wasn't easy, but it was fulfilling because I love what I do. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter on my end whether I read so much books and study a lot of these certifications and all that. But the thought kasi, of becoming one is you don't look at where you're currently at right now. You look at where you're going to be after how many years. And just focusing on that future state of you becoming one of the best certification coach, which actually pushed me more and more. Okay, especially here in Manila, you really have to, as they call it, grind. Right. You have to create a name for yourself. You have to make a statement that you belong in the table of the conversation. You are part of the conversation. You are mm-hmm. the go-to person also. So that's the story. It's, it's hard here in Manila, but because you want to do something with your career and because you want to be part of an athletic team, Mm. you do your work. So I actually really gave it all. I really just pushed every boundary, climbed every mountain, tried to understand politics as well. Mm. It's also stick in the sports. but And then eventually, it it led me to where I'm currently at right now. And I've experienced having five teams in one year. Mm. That's a lot. And it tells you that, oh, well, this guy is making, this guy has already reached that part of his career because not all teams will trust a strength and conditioning coach. Right. Not strength coach is also good. So in the industry, I think I'm one of the coaches that can be trusted already nice. because of what I have done in the craft and what I'm currently contributing as well. The journey went from just one client here in Manila. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, I'm part of the national team. I'm part of a certain professional team. I'm part of a UAP school. And then I'm part of another pro team. Wow. So it's a continuous process of just upskilling yourself so people will trust you more. My first job actually here was with a client. Mm-hmm. That was my first athlete, just one person. Mm-hmm. And I think that one person, I just gave it my all. And that one person led to one team. And that one team led to the national team. And that international, I spent like two, three years. Tons of gold medals. We created history. First time to win the world championships. Gold and silver, both Philippines. Wow. Uh, so, and so forth. So you get all these experiences. And being part of the national team is not easy because you have the pressure of carrying the flag. Right. So you can't just dilly dally. You can't, you know, na okay ra na later na ni anak lang. So that's out of the question. So I wake up early in the morning to read, to keep on updating myself and understand how I can help my athletes more. So I wake up 4 a.m. to mm. study my athletes, and then I write my training program, so on and so forth. But I think one of the things that I've learned so much as a strength coach in the journey, you have to create your own standards. So I have my own standard as a strength coach and how I do my work, and I also have my own standards on how my athletes 
can become better athletes also. It's common. I gave all my athletes these standards. This is the standard of a really great athlete. Because I've been around, not just in the Philippines, I've been outside the country also. So I look at different athletes, how they do things. I do benchmarking every time we fly out. That's what I love doing. So the journey was long, but not longer because it just, I grind, I gave my best, I respected the process, I was patient enough. And then now I'm where I'm currently at that people see you and think, oh my God, he's so successful. There's so much things, but I miss that part of the journey. You know, grabby grind, dude. Hello, sige lang. In time, in time, in time. So, yeah. Yeah. It's actually the grinding that really is the interesting part because you really work, right? And then once you have reached the fruit of your labor, it's the rewarding part where you can just breathe in and just celebrate your efforts. So just to clarify, you were a coach for beach volleyball and were you able to venture in other sports that you were a coach yeah a lot actually but more on individual work so currently i'm training frisbee athletes training track athletes again i'm training basketball athletes also so aside from me training beach volleyball or volleyball in general i have other sport athletes that i'm currently training as well so yeah i have a lot and i think you're doing well as a coach i would say Given your advantage as a coach in multiple sports, what is your strategy or unique traits or anything that makes you different from any other coaches, approaches, or alternatives whatsoever? I think what separates me from other coaches is I communicate really well. It's a really complex topic that I can simplify it and make my athletes understand faster. So I always tell my athletes, I want to win the championships, but if ever we won't win and if ever I won't last longer than I want to stay with you guys. But at the end of the day, when I leave this team, you will be smarter compared to when I started with you. And that has always been a thing. So that's the standard. My athletes are always way, 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 way smart. So they understand sciences already, physics and all of that while I'm staying there. So I think that's one. Second is I care for them so much that I will really go head to head. Some of the things that I want to happen really happen or some of the things that I request, an item, a supplement, other things that we need na needs requesting, I really go head to head that this has to be done. You have to give this one if you want to win. And that's what I always tell my athletes that you might not like me, but you will see how much I love you guys because these things will be given over time in a really fast manner. But I think third is the standards I have for myself and the standards I give to them. I don't just work for working sake. I work at that most. My athletes will always see that. I have a lot of papers here. I have my Excel sheets there. I track this one. I track that one. From time to time, I message them personally or as a team and then just ask how they are. Or even on that day, I ask how they are. What do they feel? They feel emotionally down. And then, you know, I try to mend it over. Let's try to pep talk about it. How I can help you and serve you more and better. If you're not serious in you becoming an athlete, you won't like me so much. Because I will really let you work. I always tell my athletes this, that I'm not here for you to like me, guys. But I'm here for me to help you and serve you and help you win more games. Now, if that is something that you resonate with me also, then we will work well. But if you're just here, play games, you will not like me because I will really push you to your limit. But of course, in a very scientific way, naman, di liman tong bara-bara ba? Yeah. Uh, wala, wala. So, yeah. I think that's good for your listeners, actually, Earl. I think those can be related not only in the field of sport, but also in even personal life. You know, that, that of the day, you have to have your own standards. Ah, yes. So what are your values? What's your non-negotiable values that you really abide to? And that's why some of my athletes don't understand why sometimes I get mad at them because I've been communicating to you that these are non-negotiables. This can't be bent. Other things, pwede pa, okay ra. But these things, that's a no-no. So number one for me, it's if you're not sleeping right, I cannot train you well. If you're not eating well, you're not recovering faster as well. So there's no cheat day, actually, when I'm here as yes, yes. So You have to follow what I tell you, but I will really appreciate if you question me But coming from you wanting to understand and learn, not because you just want to complain and grumble that is. So have your standards, have your values intact, and it's easier to walk through life as as a career person. That's a good point you have there, Coach Paolo. So given your experience so far, what are the lessons that you've learned as you journeyed? There's quite a lot, actually. 
I think the first one and most important in my end is learn to write your visions. As a strength coach, you have to have a vision because you cannot just do work just for the sake of, well, actually you can, but you will be dragging yourself mm-hmm. going to work. So not until you have something that you look forward to, you have to have a bigger picture of what you want to be as a strength coach, who you want to serve as a strength coach. So having a vision, then you start talking about it to someone, so it becomes a dream. Then you start writing it on your notebook, then it becomes a goal. Mm -hmm. Then you start scheduling it, then it becomes your reality. I think secondly is patience is a virtue. Nothing comes in overnight. But despite that concept, you also have to move fast. So it's not just you being slow and trusting the process or whatnot, but you're fast in acting things also. For example, one, you're fast in acting to be mentored by somebody. You can't just go whatever and do what you want to do, whatever. Second is you're fast in upskilling yourself as a strength coach. You join all this continuing education so it equips you to become a better strength and conditioning coach or even actually leadership, communication, workshops, and all that. It's very important also because if that opportunity arrives and you're not ready, that opportunity will be taken away from you right, right away. You cannot wait that the door will open. Na you'll start equipping yourself pa on that day. So that's going to be too late, no? There's no marathon athlete who trains on the day of the race. So I think that came in handy for me, that is. And then I think lastly is one of the most important lessons I've learned since 2018 I came back in the sports scene is to look for a mentor, to look for someone who you can look up to. So you have standards for yourself. So who was that for me when I was starting in 2019? That was Carlo Buzicelli. Aside from Pio Solon, Pio Solon has always been there for me. Carlo Buzicelli is one of the best sports scientists in the world. He's been sending high elite athletes in the Olympic Games for so long. Co-authored best-selling books on sports science. I became an apprentice for two years with him. So kung sa isugo niya, sige go. Kung asa siya mo, adto, adto sa go. Bisag sometimes it comes out from your pocket, then okay, go. Actually, I really miss that time because coffee time has been really huge for me with him. I get to ask all these questions. You get to understand. You get to know where your mistakes are. You get scolded. <laughs> and all that. And all you have to do is just keep on saying yes. Say yes, say yes, say yes, say yes. But I think lastly is you show up every day. You don't miss every opportunity. Dili ka mag-inarte. Ay, dili ko anak. Kaingunan ni anak. You just show up. Yes. When you're starting, saying yes goes a long way. So, you know how to say no in the future also. Muna, siya. Kanang four lessons for me are huge, actually. Very huge. But it's also applied across all areas aside from sports. All right. Yeah. So you decided to establish a sports and fitness instruction. Take us how you established it. I put up Meraki Training and Sports during the pandemic. I think it was 2022, just to get by because I don't have any money. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't the brand yet, okay? It was just a freelance, whatever. But I think I put up the brand because I want to try venturing and opening a brand. Meraki Training and Sports is your all-around fitness training instruction. We help athletes, we help former athletes and athletes at heart to reach their fitness goals. Under Meraki Training and Sports, you have Meraki Training, you have Meraki Education, you have Meraki Sports. Meraki Training is your training. We have athletes that we train, we help them achieve their athletic goals. We send you training programs or we see face-to-face. Or we talk to a team and then we help them. It's all about training. It's all about fitness. It's all about athletic. It's all about lifting weights, running and all that. So the next one is your Meraki Education. It's your continuing education firm. We empower and equip coaches in their professional careers. And we create a space of champion makers and purpose-driven dreamers or purpose-driven coaches in the mid. So we help them understand how do you train your athletes, what are the sciences, what are the technicalities, how do you write a training program to the basic level. Those kind of things are being discussed in Meraki Education. And our target market for this is besides in Mindanao, mm. not here in Manila. Mm, okay. But we have a few in Manila, but it's majority there. Your Meraki Sports is your sports events. If we organize a competition, a fun run, we organize a CrossFit competition or whatnot, or we have a sports clinic, so anything that relates to sports event, that's Meraki Sports. So, yeah. 
with these areas of Meraki. How was the reception? Okay, I'll be honest. This is a really authentic conversation. Naman, eh. So mm-hmm. we came to a point that we really boomed. We had really high gross profit, high margins also. And the people were just joining us here and there. We don't have to market anymore. When we opened up a Meraki Beach Volleyball event here in Manila, it, most of the UAAP schools joined. We had around 100 athletes who joined in the event for beach volleyball. My Meraki education here in Manila and previously were really, really high. We have 60 students per workshop. So that's it. It's just so happened uh, I shifted focus when I was hired with the national team. Anything that you don't put focus into, dies. Right. So that's what happened with Meraki Training and Sports. And probably because my idea of business back then was not the same as with my idea of business right now. Or how to take good care of a brand is not the same with how I take good care of it right now. So mm-hmm. I had a lot of ups and downs with the brand. I actually closed so many brands also already. Mm-hmm. But this time, this is the brand that I'm really fighting for. And I don't want to take this one out. And I want to see this through. And at the moment, when I open it up again, early this year, we, especially the Meraki education part, I currently had 120 graduates Wow! Already from the two phases of the course itself. So pretty much receptive, probably because people saw the vision. People felt that we really take good care of them. It's three phases of Meraki education. Phase one, phase two, and then phase three will be next year. So during the first two phases, we really made sure that the person that's joining the course will really feel that they're being taken care of. And mm-hmm. they feel that they're special enough that we really go out of our way to do something for them. So that was the goal. So na ko yung mga retakers, na yung mga mubalik, people who just recommends us. Like, I still market it so hard. Not hard selling. We strategize the whole marketing plan, selling and all of that. But we have a few students already that just sends us messages and like, Coach, I'm going to bring eight students of mine, huh? Okay. Nice. Bringing eight people. Or, Coach, I'll be bringing five people. Or, Coach, I'll be bringing ten people. Or whatnot. So... On reception, I think people are really seeing the value of it. But again, since it's business, it's process. Business, it's systems. I'm still fixing a few systems, a few structures right now. But probably because of everything that I have been joining. My upskilling right now, I'm good early. Is I still upskill myself on strategy and coaching. That's automatic. That's not going to leave me. But my upskilling right now is more on the business side, branding. So those things. I've been joining about so much different business classes. I even took a, a mini MBA mm-hmm. just to understand the business and all of that. So... Probably we're going to do well based on projections and based on plans and activities that we'll be doing. We're opening so much programs, both on education and then Meraki sports also, and also Meraki training. So there's a lot of coming soon. It's going to happen. You'll just see that in some of our posts soon. But yeah, I guess that's it. So given that you fight for Meraki, where do you want to see it a few years from now? Meraki as a whole... Probably it's really putting impact in the sports industry, actually, especially on the coaches side. So my thrust right now is on equipping so many coaches. That's my thrust because I cannot coach all the athletes. Mm. I would rather equip all the coaches so the coaches will equip the athletes and empower them as well. So I think one day, the next five years, hopefully we're able to equip around 2,000 to 5,000 coaches already. So they can easily equip also on the same amount of athletes or I think double or 10,000 to 15,000 athletes on their end. So I see Meraki training and sports become the prime mover in the sports industry in Visayas and Mindanao. Slowly. I don't want to make it fast. Mm-hmm. I, I did that happened already. It did not give me good. Yeah. It's in the systems that will matter. So I think that's what I'm seeing Meraki training and sports in the next five years that one day, one day, one day, one day we'll be able to equip around that much of coaches. I'm looking forward to what Meraki will do. So taking from there, what would be your advice for those who are aspiring to be athletes and also advice for those who are coaches of athletes? Love your athletes. Very simple. No, actually, not only that. Love yourself so you can love your athletes more. When you learn to love yourself as a coach, you have standards that are high. That's scary. 
and that will push you to become a better coach and that it's automatic to upskill yourself and in turn you get to love your athlete in a better way not in the quote unquote old school way that you just say go 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 let's go let's do this that's not how coaching works it's not just that so i think for aspiring coaches or already coaches actually learn to love yourself more and more and more so you can love all your athletes way 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 better than other coaches for athletes for starting athletes if you're young tell your parents to support you all out and tell your parents to love the coaches also and work with them don't be against them our coaches are not stupid they make decisions hard decisions most of the time but for aspiring athletes number one stay disciplined discipline goes a long long way if you want to be a separator from other people Second, get a benchmark. Go and look for someone that you can look up to and then follow what he's doing, everything. If it's good, then follow it. And then I think third, learn to love your sport so it will not make you easily burnt out. And that is so kind of. Yeah, very well said, Coach Pao. So let's talk about those, not the type who wants to physically move, but they make a decision to start moving, what would you encourage those who make a decision to be physically active? It's the same thing that I said kanina, Earl, na you have to really sit down and think hard and write down how do you want to see yourself in what, 20 years? You have to look at that far that at 60 years old, you still want to be able to run, lift heavy things, and not suffer from osteoporosis or any other illnesses. So with that said, you go back to the present and you check, are my activities leading me to the kind of life that I want when I turn 60? If not, things has to change. So I think, number one, write down that vision. I want to be this kind of a person when I turn 60. So it's long term. You have something to look forward to. You have something to aim towards too. And then secondly is you schedule it. So unless we schedule it, it's just a cloud. It's just floating around the air. Unless you schedule it, nothing will happen. So you schedule that on this day at 5 p.m., I will run. Or on this day at 6 p.m., I'll join 0 to 6 that's it. They always tell people this. At the end of the day, you don't want to regret at the end of your life. Now, my tag ako na lang gitig good care hong kaugaling mo. The sad part is, this is not part of our curriculum. This is not part of our programming as a society that we have to take good care of ourselves. Right. Take out all the things, take out everything, every principle of exercise. The bottom line is just what? Self care. A hundred percent self care. That is if you respect yourself so much, number one. And then secondly is that is if you love yourself as well. So if you have those two points in here, you love your life, you love yourself, you respect your body also, then you do all the necessary means so that your body gets uplifted. That's why I don't believe actually, or I don't believe in people say, I'm sorry, hindi mong good ako active. Yeah, because you don't love yourself. That's it. I love myself so much. I go to the gym, I work out so that when I go, out and do my work, I can double my work because I have all the energy in the world to produce so much, to be as creative as I can, to give my bosses everything that I want or what they want, and then I don't get tired. That's why mm -hmm. when people say, Coach Pa, wh wh why is your energy still the same at 4 a.m. all the way to 8 p.m.? I take my time. I work out. I don't work out for two hours. I work out for 30 to 45 minutes. I'm also busy. But allotting that time. So if you're starting, you start with a vision. Second, you schedule it. Third, you join a community where you're encouraged to work out, be on your toes, and take good care of yourself. So I think that's it. So people here, you're listening here. I'm not mad. I'm just so passionate about it because I don't want people to die early. And mind you, it's not just obesity. But also, you know, the lack of muscle mass and all that is. But muna na ang thrive karon. At the end of the day, health is wealth. At the end of the day, your body is the temple of the spirit. So wherever that takes you, hopefully we take good care of ourselves so we can take good care of others more. Yeah. I think that's key there that if you really love yourself, then part of it is also loving your body. So thank you for that reminder, Coach Pao. So 
I just also want to address one thing. If you want to start, but you are constrained by, let's say, financial. If I go to a gym and I would want to be trained by a coach, but I don't have enough to be personally trained. So I would rely on YouTube videos asked from friends who have experience working out, most especially in strength and conditioning. Others would argue that having a coach is better. Your thoughts on that, Coach Pao? I think one, it's a case-to-case, Mungud. But I would always say, why do we need a coach? Number one, you don't have to study anymore. You're taking a coach for efficiency. You just go to the gym and do what he tells you very fast. Second is, you have accountability person. Someone checks on you every now and then. Someone pushes you. Someone encourages you. That is. So efficiency-wise, check. Accountability person-wise, check. Because of these two boxes are checked. Results are more accurate aside from you do it on your own. Because if we do it on our own, number one, we still have to study it. It will take time to understand some of the principles of strength work. Number two, we don't have anybody to tell us. So when we say, I'm lazy today, I'm lazy today, I will not go to the gym. Nobody was calling you. Those kind of things matters. But if because of financial constraint, then that's okay. One, you have your body weights, go to YouTube University, look for calisthenics, and then just follow what they tell you. Well, of course, with extra caution, your individual things are not being considered, but that is easier than not doing anything that is. So over time, you will get your result, but it will take a little longer compared to someone who has a coach. But the result will come. You yes. just have to be paid. It. So if you don't want to have a coach, okay, mahal kayo ang coach, which is really, really an investment. It's yeah. way better than a car. That's why when people ask me, I don't tell them, here are my rates. I don't call it rates. Here are my investment fees because it's an investment. It's not just you paying money. But if you don't have a coach because of financial reasons, just go to YouTube, type in bodyweight exercises, do it consistently every day for the next one year. And let's see what the result is on the first year. And then you do it again on the second year. And then you'll never know what will happen on the fifth year. Okay, Muram Jagkwan early. Money investments. It's like it's compounding interest. It is what we call it's compounding. So your results now will compound the results next year, and then will compound the next year. And then before you know it, your results are already huge. You have a big amount of money already if you talk about investments. But I would rather see people move than just keep on blabbering about not having money. And YouTube's there just waiting. Or even ask Chat GPT. Just oh, message yeah. Chat GPT. Hello. Chat GPT, I need a coach who understands the science, the principles of exercise. So your prompts, the prompts are there and then pack, Chat GPT gives you all the training program in the world. And then you just follow it for the next one, two, three, four, five years and then you'll get good results. Thank you for that, Coach Pao, for inspiring in their own little way to do some movement because movement is really what's needed most, especially in this digital era. So much that we've talked about the health with what you have been through so far. What has it become of you now? I would say I've become a better person, a better friend, and a better boss. As you grow older, you spend more time on your own and you start reflecting so much on the things that's happening around you or the things that happen in your life. And you understand that there are a lot of things that you have to actually take out of your habits, patterns that you have to take out of yourself. And the journey made me a better person because I learned how to relate to a lot of people already now. As compared to when I started, I became a better person because of that journey that I've gone through from strength and conditioning coaching to becoming an entrepreneur right now or a visionary person. I learned how to communicate better because of all my communication mistakes. I've learned how to socialize with different people in different walks of life. I started as a shy person and a very introverted one. Right now, if you try to look at me, people will always say, Ha, talaga ba? Are you really sure that you're introverted? Yeah, I'm 100%. If you let me choose to go out in BGC or stay at home, I will 100% or 1 million percent choose stay at home. I don't want to mingle with people, but I have to do so. And I've learned to enjoy doing so because that's my job. And if I don't network with people also, the business will not go up also and I won't be able to coach people as well. It made me a better coach, 
a better friend because I get to give them suggestions on problems that needs to be faced or that needs to be solutionized, quote unquote. I became a better friend because I learned how to relate more on where they're coming from as a person and not just quickly judge them on how I see them at the moment. I've learned how to put my feet on their own shoes so I really get them or and empathize what they're going through. I learned to really just tell them also at the end of the day, you have to push yourself, stand back up and walk again. I became a better encourager. That is. I became a better boss because I'm very strict when I started. I would want to be doing everything on my own. But right now, I learned to delegate some of the work. And my role is to just envision and see if the plan is working or not and try sit down with everybody and reconvene and replan. So I've learned how to make them leaders also, not just me leading them. So I'm slowly teaching the people that's working with me to have self-leadership, not just to wait for the leader to tell you what needs to be done. But I think I get the people that I'm working with more than compared to when I started. So how was the journey right now? How it affected me? I became a better person in totality, whether boss, friend, boyfriend, or whatnot. And you'll eventually become better and better each day. So I'll be rooting for you, Coach Pao, not only in professional development, but personal development. And of course, more importantly, spiritual development. So to wrap up, what wakes you up early in the morning? What wakes me up early in the morning? It has changed over time. Before, what wakes me up in the morning is because of the job that I'm doing. That makes me so excited to just meet my athletes, do the work, do the grind. But it has changed over time because you know, I've become a better Christian, quote-unquote. What makes me up early in the morning is to just meet with my God every day. Really early in the morning at 4 a.m. Uh-huh. So I wake up 3.50 for the past two weeks already. I wake up. 3.50, I spend my time from 4 a.m. all the way to 5.30, 6. Then I do my work. There. So that's what is waking me up every morning right now. Just that excitement. To, I can't wait to just sit down, zip my mouth, and just listen to God. And spend time, pray, learn more about you. So it has changed over time. It's different already. I spend my time early in the morning because my day is already packed. I don't have time anymore. So Yeah, wow. And that's it. I just love that, Coach Paul. I think it's important to really plug yourself to the true reason of your living. I hope for those who are Christians, always keep God first and you will never be lost to where He's directed to you every single step of the way. Thank you once again, Coach Paul, for your time to share your thoughts and insights with us. It's been a wonderful time. Thanks, Earl. Really enjoyed, really enjoyed. Hopefully your listeners will enjoy this one also and will learn a thing or two from what I have been blabbering. Surely, surely they will learn a lot from me. All right. Thanks.